what drives change in life? What motivates us to alter our behavior? I think for each of us, there's probably areas in our life that we would like to change. Habits that we would like to get rid of. Perhaps desires that we wish were not there. Where is the power for change? Certainly we see biblically in our passage and elsewhere that there is knowledge that changes us. As Romans 12 says, we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. But if that is true, then then what knowledge specifically is powerful enough to bring change? I think we can admit that not all knowledge has the power to change. If knowledge in and of itself could change us, we would all be healthier. We know that proper diet and exercise would improve our health, and yet we often find ourselves in front of an open refrigerator right before bed. Or perhaps it's just me. Because there are desires within us that trump our knowledge. So what knowledge changes people? If, if it were any knowledge, there would be no more alcoholics. There would be no more gluttons. There would be no more drug addicts. If knowledge itself could change us. Well, as we walk through Ephesians, Paul in chapter 4 is about to make a pretty significant shift in calling God's people to change, to reflect the life that has saved them, to reflect Jesus Christ. He is about to urge us to walk in a manner worthy of our calling, a passage that we will consider next week, Lord willing. Paul is going to call upon us to change our ways, to alter our behavior, to look more like the title that he has already given us, holy ones, saints. But we all know that command itself lacks the power to bring about what it demands. We do have knowledge that change is good for us. We have desire even sometimes to alter our behavior, to change our ways. And yet each week we come And we fall to our knees confessing our sin, though we know the commandments, because the commandments themselves lack the power to change us. So if we are going to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, what knowledge in particular will bring about this change that we desire? Well, I believe our passage this morning tells us And before Paul makes this shift in chapter 4 that we will look forward to next week, where he calls upon us to change, he prays that we would have a certain knowledge in our text this morning, the only knowledge that gives us the power to actually change. And as we consider Paul's prayer this morning, I'd like to do so under three headings. The first is the father of the household. Well, as we look at Ephesians 3, beginning in verse 14, we find Paul once again saying, for this reason, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. As we said last week, Paul had begun this prayer, but but made a little detour to defend his apostolic office in the midst of suffering. He wants to defend to his reader the fact that, yes, he is an apostle, and he's in prison, and these two realities do not contradict one another. Well, after that 13-verse excursus, he now returns to his original prayer. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Well, what is the reason that Paul is citing? 
Well, that reason goes back to chapter chapter two, that we are no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That though there was once a dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile and between God and all sinners, that this wall has been flooded out by the precious blood of Jesus and that that which was once two has now become one in Christ. Paul explains that this new humanity is God's household, is God's family. And as we looked at a few weeks ago, that this family, this household is being built into a holy temple, a temple that is the fulfillment of what Solomon's temple pointed to. And and is the fulfillment of prophecies like Ezekiel's, that there is this temple to come that will be far greater. Well, as we saw, Paul says that in the church, God is bringing this about, that he is building his temple. And these things are important because these themes continue in Paul's prayer, and they help us with some of the language that we find. That, that God is building a household and that this household is being transformed into a new creation temple that ultimately, according to the book of Revelation, will eclipse all creation. And that this temple and this household is built upon the foundation of Christ's resurrection. And as with this in mind, it helps us with some of his language, including verse 15 in our passage that has given translators and commentators a bit of trouble. Paul says that he bows his knees before the Father, and as the ESV translates, whom every family on heaven and earth is named. Now, now there is a general truth that all humanity has their origin in God. We all come from Adam, and Adam is said to be a son of God. So there's a general sense in which we can say that all the families of the earth have God, generally speaking, as a father figure, if you will. But that's not what Paul is talking about here. Another way to translate this verse is how the King James translates, and I think it's helpful. It says, I bow my knees unto the Father, of whom the whole family and heaven and earth is named. Not every family, but the whole family. These are both possibilities for translation, but I think the whole family better fits the context. Paul has just been talking about what was once divided has now been made one household in Christ. And so Paul is going to his knees to pray to the one father of this one household made up of Jew and Gentile, all who have faith in Jesus. And Paul says that this family is not only on earth, but earth and heaven. That is, it includes us who have faith in Christ. It it includes those who have died in faith, those souls made righteous, as Hebrews says. One family in heaven and earth. And Paul is praying to the father of this one household, this one family made up of all who have faith in Jesus. Well, if you'll recall from our study of chapter 2, we find that Paul very intentionally mixes these metaphors of, of household and temple in order to bring together streams of Old Testament imagery. Well, he continues this in our text this morning. God is father of this new creation household, but he is also filler of this new creation temple, which is what I want to look at next, the filler of the temple. Notice the phrases that Paul uses throughout our passage. That the the spirit would be in your inner being or your inner man that Christ might dwell in your hearts, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. 
that his glory will fill the church. We, we've come fairly accustomed to the language that Jesus is in our hearts. But where does that come from? Well, it comes from God's presence in the temple. The temple and tabernacle of the Old Testament where the Shekinah glory of God that, that led the people out of Israel and that burned atop Mount Sinai enters into the tabernacle. It fills the Holy of Holies with the presence of God. Of course, we also know from the prophets that this presence departs the temple because of the people's rebellion, because of their sin. But as we read in Ezekiel this morning that there is coming a day when a new temple will be built and God's presence will inhabit it. And that is this great prophecy that we look forward to. Well, we have seen so far in the letter that Paul makes the case that this end times temple is being built in the church. And now as he prays, he is praying that the spirit, that same spirit that filled the temple of old will now dwell within his people. His prayer in several different ways is that the glory of God by way of the spirit of Christ would dwell within us by faith, pulling from these Old Testament prophecies to show that here in the church, in the people of God, God himself is dwelling. And Paul is praying that that reality would come true, both corporately as a church, but also individually as, as those who have faith. Well, one potential confusing matter here is the reality that Paul has said that God has already filled this temple. Historically, we can look at Acts and see when this happens, right? In Pentecost, that the church is baptized in the Holy Spirit, that, that the Spirit of God fills the church. And so why is Paul here praying that it would happen again? Well, I think what Paul is asking for is the subjective realization of this filling. Yes, it is true that we as God's people are objectively filled with the Spirit through faith. But it is also true that that filling is slowly taking its effect on us as we grow in our understanding of it. Think, think of it this way. We've, when you first move into a house, it is your house. Your mail is delivered there, at least within a few months. It is your address. You live there. Your presence fills this house. You eat there. You sleep there. And yet it takes months, if not years, to make that house your own. To make that building reflect your own personality. When Jolene and I bought our first house in Florida, it was, in retrospect, a complete dump. We were excited about it, but it was awful. And we were broke. And it took years to make that house look anything like our personality. Well, in a similar way, that's how the Spirit's renovation works in our own lives. That, yes, the Spirit fills us, and yet it takes many, many, many years for him to make this house reflect his own personality. And that's what Paul is praying for here. For the Spirit has still much work to do in us. And we all want this, don't we? We all desire this change. We all want to be renovated by God's Spirit. We want to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. And in the next half of Ephesians, we're going to get 
three chapters of instruction on this. What does it look like to be those that are renovated by God's presence, renovated by his spirit? It will be good and godly instruction, but but we also know that instruction alone lacks the power to bring about this renovation. I mean, we gather every week and at the beginning of the service, hear God's law. If you've been here for much time at all, you probably have much of it memorized. It's written on your heart. You know the commandments. And so why is it, even though we know the commandments, that every week when the minister asks, have you fully obeyed the Lord and all that he has commanded? You all respond in the same way. And it's not just because it's written down. No, but we have sinned in thought, word, and in deed. That response isn't just written down liturgically. It's we know it to be true of each one of us. How is it that we have these commandments memorized? We know them, and yet every week we can say that with full truth. No, I have not kept these commandments. I have not loved God, and I have not loved my neighbor. We respond in this way because it's true. And even if you don't have these commandments memorized word for word, our conscience bears witness to the fact that we know them whenever we break them. At least I pray that it does. One of my seminary professors explained it this way, that imagine you're on a sailboat in the middle of the sea and you have maps, you have a compass, you even have a GPS and, and a sonar and every imaginable tool that you would need to tell you exactly where you are and exactly where you must go. God's law is like that. His instruction, his commandments are like that. They tell us where we are and they, they tell us the way home. They tell us exactly where we need to go. The problem is, is they provide no wind. You can know where you are. You can know exactly where you need to go, but without wind, you are stuck in the waters. And doesn't life sometimes feel that way? When, we're, when we desire to do good things, when we know the good things that we are called to do and yet so often feel stuck. We know what Paul is about to tell us in chapter 4, that we are to be humble and that we are to be gentle and to be patient. We're to bear with one another in love. We are to be eager to maintain unity in our relationships. We know this stuff. Why can't we do it? Why do we return week after week, admitting that we have not done exactly what we know that we're supposed to do? Well, I think our prayer of confession actually provides us with the answer. This morning we prayed, you alone know how often we have grieved you by wasting your gifts, by wandering from your ways, by forgetting your love. How often is that on your list of things to confess day to day that we've forgotten God's love? It doesn't often rise to the top. And yet I would argue that all of our sin and all of our disobedience comes because we have forgotten God's love for us. And it's the knowledge of God's love that provides wind for our sails. There is a knowledge that provides, that provides power to change, according to Paul. It is knowing, remembering, 
comprehending the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus. And it's that I want to consider finally this morning, the love of God. Before Paul moves to chapter 4 and spends significant time giving us instruction for our lives, he prays this, that you would be rooted and grounded in God's love. And that you would have the strength by God's Spirit to comprehend knowledge that Paul says surpasses knowledge. And this is that knowledge. That you would comprehend what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And in that, that you would be filled with the fullness of God. According to Paul, there is knowledge that changes us. There is knowledge that alters our desires and gives the power to change. It is the knowledge of God's love. It is God's love that puts wind into our sails. And Paul, in his prayer, before moving on to the exterior realities, which are so important, he prays that our hearts and minds, above all, would be renovated by the knowledge of God's love. And Paul recognizes that this knowledge is so lofty and unbelievable that we would need the Spirit's power to even start to believe it. It's the Spirit's dwelling that helps us to understand. And as we grow in our understanding, we are being more renovated by God's Spirit. One of the dangers of preaching through one of Paul's letters over the course of several months is that we get into sections on instruction and forget the fact that Paul has spent half of his letter explaining God's great love. We so want to move on to the instructions thinking that they alone are going to change us. We can often forget where he has spent the majority of his time. We forget the things that he has told us, like before the foundations of the earth were laid. He chose you in love. That he, as a good father, predestined you for adoption and has made you a co-heir with his son, Jesus. That he gives to you every blessing of the Holy Spirit. Not because of anything that you have done, but because of his great love for you, even while you were dead and trespasses and sins. He, in love, made you alive together with Christ Jesus. A love so strong that Paul explains neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor heights nor depths nor anything in all creation would ever separate you from this love. A love that was shown to us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. As we will sing in a few minutes, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. Beloved, of all the things that Paul could pray for in this moment, his prayer is that you would know this love, this fatherly affection, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life, a love that is so abundantly patient as we are being renovated, that he is pleased to forgive all of our sins, even in the process. One of the greatest thinkers and theologians of the 20th century, uh, Karl Barth, who is not always a safe guide theologically, but uh, he, he was a, a, a very important voice against the liberalism of his time, the, the theological liberalism of his time. 
He's written volumes by way of commentaries, systematic theologies, philosophy texts. His church dogmatics alone is, is 14 volumes. He is extremely prolific, an extremely important thinker. Well, Dr. Bart was once asked, what is the most profound theological truth you have ever learned? And his reply was this, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Simple enough for a child to sing, and yet a knowledge that according to Paul surpasses all potential knowledge. People of God, this is Paul's prayer. It is our prayer for you as pastors and elders that you would know this love, that you would grow to comprehend it. To quote our, our kids' storybook Bible, that God loves you with a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. A love that according to the psalm we sang this morning will follow you all of your days. May he grant that we grow in the knowledge of this love. And that as we grow in this knowledge, we would grow to love him. Amen? Let's pray.